All right, guys, welcome to the chapter two video. This corresponds to chapter two in your book. As you go through and you watch this video and the resource videos that I've posted online, please make sure that you are actually reading the chapter. Focus on the key terms because I don't necessarily hit everything in these lecture videos as you would read in your, your textbook. Make sure that you read the figures the closer look sections, especially in this chapter, because that's where it talks about mass spectro spectrometry, which is going to be a very important aspect in this chapter. Also make sure that you look at the examples, all of the ones that are worked out for you already, because that gives you a very good idea for the steps that you should follow as you go through your homework. So again, this is chapter two. So, your notes start with John Dalton and his contribution to the atom and his atomic theory. However, when we look at the early history of chemistry, it actually starts in about 400 BC with the Greeks. They proposed all matter was made up of four elements, which was earth, wind, fire, and air. Now, this was a very long time ago. We really don't even look at this anymore. But we do start with Democritus. Democritus was the first to use the term atomos, which he then said all matter can be divided into indivisible atoms. So really it starts with Democritus, and then you can go through the next 2,000 years and look at everyone else that contributed, but we're just going to focus on some of the key aspects of atomic theory. So first we start with Dalton. Dalton proposed the atomic theory of matter, and you can read his atomic theory. So his first postulate was that each element is composed of atoms. His second postulate was that all atoms of a given element are identical, but the atoms of one element are different from other elements. So all atoms of oxygen are the same, all atoms of nitrogen are the same, but those are different. The third postulate, he said, atoms of one element cannot be changed into atoms of a different element by chemical reactions. Atoms are neither created nor destroyed. And then his fourth postulate said that compounds are formed when you have atoms combining in a given ratio. So if we look at this theory, some of his postulates are no longer correct. And we're going to look at some of the whys. But his big modifications are for the first and the second postulate, right? Each element is composed of extremely small particles called atoms, and he said that they were indivisible. Well, we've had a modification to that. We're going to look at what that is, but you probably remember um, from first year. And then in his second postulate, that one is no longer correct either. And again, we're going to look at isotopes, which proves that wrong. His third postulate is based on the law of conservation of mass, and his, and his fourth postulate was based on the law of definite proportions. And we looked at the law of definite proportions in chapter one, but we will uh, visit that very briefly in this section as well. So Dalton's third postulate focused on the law of conservation of mass, and this still holds true. The total mass of substances present at the end of a chemical process is the same as the mass before. Okay, you cannot destroy mass. If you have 10 grams before, you have to have 10 grams after. And this is where moles come in and we look at, at coefficients. But law of conservation of mass holds true still. Dalton also, like I mentioned on the last slide, deduced the law of multiple proportions or the law of definite proportions. It's called many different things. But what he says is, a given compound always contains exactly the same proportions of elements by mass. So water is always H2O, hydrogen peroxide is always H2O2, and so on. So after Dalton, we come to the discovery of the electron. And J.J. Thompson, who was an English scientist, found that when high voltage was applied to a tube, a ray, which he called a cathode ray, since it emanated from the negative side, and that has to do with the cathode, but we're not going to worry about that right now. He said that this cathode ray was produced at the negative side of this tube, and you can see the cathode, which is negative. We'll talk a lot more about that when we do electrochemistry toward the end of the year. 
the negative side of this tube repelled the negative side of the electric field. And so what he postulated was the ray had to be a stream of negative particles, which are now called electrons. And he found that these electrons have a certain charge. So J.J. Thompson measured the deflection of the beams of electrons to determine the charge to mass ratio. And when he calculated this, he took the charge on electrons, which is E, just a lowercase e, and he divided it by the mass of an electron. And so he found both of these through the, the cathode ray tube experiment. And what he found was this equaled negative 1.76 times 10 to the 8th coulombs per gram. So he found that one gram of electrons has a charge of negative 1.76 times 10 to the 8th coulombs. And this is how, based on the mass of an electron, you could find the charge of just one single electron. And so again, he used this cathode ray tube experiment to essentially determine that electrons existed in an atom. And then he looked at the plum pudding model, which we're going to look at in a couple slides. But he found the plum pudding model, the first real model of the atom. And this was all because of this cathode ray tube experiment. And from there, he went to um, find the charge charge to mass ratio. And then uh, Millikan, Robert Millikan, who was an American scientist at the University of Chicago, used this information to perform his own experiment. And so Robert Millikan did the oil drop experiment. So he was known for performing the oil drop experiment. And what he did was he sprayed charged oil droplets into a chamber. So this chamber right here, he sprayed charged oil droplets. And then what he did was he stopped their fall due to gravity by adjusting the voltage within this, this chamber. And so you can see he had electrically charged plates and he adjusted that voltage. And then what he did was he used the voltage that was needed to stop their drop due to gravity um, he measured that voltage and he used that to calculate the charge on the drop of oil, which then he used to determine the, the charge on an electron. And he used that to calculate the mass. So he did this very complicated experiment and he used the charge to mass ratio that Thompson discovered to determine the charge of an electron and the mass of an electron. So Robert Millikan took Thompson's ratio and then determined the actual charge and mass of a single electron. Now, as I mentioned when discussing Thompson and the cathode ray tube experiment, I briefly mentioned the plum pudding model. So this plum pudding model was put forward by Thompson. It was the first real model of an atom besides Dalton's sphere. So what Thompson said was there has to be electrons in the atom. But he said that it was almost like raisins in bread. They're just kind of spread out. Or you can think about it as a chocolate chip cookie. The electrons are just spread out within this positive sphere. So this was the atom around 1900. And what Thompson did was discover the electron. Millikan then came and determined the charge and mass of a single electron. And then from this point forward, scientists used this model and adapted it with their own experiments. And before we continue on with the model of the atom, there was one scientist, um, Henry Becquerel. He was French and he found out really by accident um, that there was such thing as radioactivity. And radioactivity, there's a whole field of nuclear chemistry and this, this stems from the whole idea of radioactivity. When we look at radioactivity, um, this was discovered or was used by Rutherford. There were three types of radioactive emission. You have alpha particles, which are equivalent to a helium nucleus. So the helium nucleus is 4 over 2 He. So it's a helium atom with a mass of 4 with with two protons. This is the largest radioactive particle. 
since this is larger than the rest, early atomic studies typically used alpha particles. Then you have beta particles, which are simply a high-speed electron. So beta particles have a mass of zero, a charge of negative one, with a symbol of E. So these beta particles are high-speed electrons, still particles though. And then finally, the third type that was used were gamma rays. Gamma rays are pure energy. So these are just energy. They're not actually particles at all. They are the most penetrating, therefore they are the most dangerous. And you can see in this diagram at the bottom, you have a radioactive substance when you shoot each of the particles through. Alpha rays or alpha particles are positively charged. Gamma rays have no charge. Beta rays are negatively charged. And you can read through more on each of these three types. Alpha are the easiest to stop. Gamma is the most difficult to stop. And so these are the particles that we'll talk about as we go through further experiments such as the gold foil experiment. But radioactivity was discovered by accident by the French scientist. So after the discovery of radioactivity in about 1911, Ernest Rutherford was an English scientist. He, who was a pioneer in radioactive studies, carried out experiments to test Thompson's plum pudding model. So he was performing his own experiments to try to test and verify the plum pudding model. And what he did was he shot alpha particles at a thin sheet of gold foil. And he did this because he thought that if Thompson was correct, then the very large alpha particles would blast right through the thin foil. And he expected them to pass through with very minor and occasional deflections. So then he observed the pattern of the scatter of particles and was able to use his observations to then postulate his own ideas of the atom. Now, what he found was most of the alpha particles passed straight through. So most of them did pass straight through, but many of them were deflected at very large angles and some of them even reflected back and he then said the plum pudding model can't be correct. So he used these observations to postulate his new idea of the atom. So since some particles deflected at large angles, they must have had a close encounter with a very positive center of the atom. Um, those that were reflected had more of a direct hit with some positive aspect. Um, and so from this, Thompson's model couldn't be correct. And from this, he conceived the nuclear atom. So Rutherford postulated that there had to be a very small, dense nucleus that was positive. So he said that there had to be a dense, positive core, which he called the nucleus. And this center contains most of the mass of the atom, while the remainder must be empty space. So he said that there has to be a nucleus in the center with all the positive, and then most of the volume of the atom is empty space. And the reason that it's empty space is because a lot of the, the alpha particles shot straight through, but then the ones that reflected all reflected at that positive center. And as you look through the gold foil experiment, there is a video that's posted under the resources section, and you'll find that there's multiple videos posted for the oil drop experiment, for Dalton's atomic theory, and make sure you watch those as well because those provide more of the microscopic view of these different experiments. So we have other subatomic particles. We have protons, neutrons, and electrons. We've already talked about the electron. It's the negative charge. Um, it's the same size as a proton or neutron, but it's about one two thousandth of the mass. Um, the electron, again, discovered by Thompson, this is what is responsible for bonding and for um, a lot of chemical reactions. But then we have protons. Protons were discovered by Rutherford through his gold foil experiment. Um, again, protons are positive. They are responsible for the identity of the element. So this is what defines atomic number. And then we have the neutron, which was discovered by James Chadwick much later. And the neutron has no charge. 
very similar to a proton in terms of size and mass, and neutrons are responsible for isotopes, okay, because neutrons are what alter the mass number. So we have the proton, the neutron, the electron. These subatomic particles are what proves Dalton's first postulate void. Okay? His first postulate said that atoms cannot be divisible. They're indestructible and indivisible. Well, that's not true because we can have subatomic particles now. So continuing on with subatomic particles, like I mentioned, protons, electrons, only particles that have a charge. Protons and neutrons have essentially the same mass, but the mass of an electron is so small we can essentially ignore it. So we can see down here we have the proton plus one with the mass. The proton is what is responsible for atomic number, right? Atomic number is same as the number of protons. Neutrons are what alter the mass number. And then the electrons are what are responsible for bonding. Okay, so these are the three different subatomic particles.